Hi, I'm Dave Grossman. My background, I'm a son of a cop. I'm a uh, paratrooper, army ranger, West Point psychology professor, professor of the science, author, a book on killing, Operator Pulitzer. Didn't win, just no. <laughs> Here we go. How, how, how many kids killed by school fire? In all of North America, America, Canada, total kids killed by school fire in all of North America in the last 50 years. Anybody? Zero. Not one single kid has been killed by school fire anywhere in North America in half a century. How many kids have been killed by school violence? Violence? 1998 alone, across North America, we had 35 dead and a quarter of a million serious injuries from violence in this school. How many killed by fire that year? Zero. Now, if you know anything about it, so Dave, the 98, 99 school year, that's the year Columbine and Tabor, Alberta happened. That's an anomaly. That's not a representative year. Oh, yeah? In 04, we had a new all-time record dead. 48 dead from violence in our schools. How many killed by fire that year? Zero. I've got a lot of educators out here. Y'all, y'all help me sign a grade. What kind of grade do we get for keeping the kids safe from fire? Come on, what's our fire grade? I, I give us a big old A plus. What's our grade for keeping the kids safe from violence? Uh, I'd say great big honk and F, yeah. Big old Arkansas F there, yeah. Can everybody agree we need some improvement in that category? We'll take a look over the ceiling there. See all the fire sprinklers up there? Can you spot them? And look at the smoke alarms up there. And while you're looking up there, you know that material that roof is made of is, uh, is you know, fire, by, by fire code is, is fireproof material, yeah? And drop you on down to the exit sign, or, 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 or as they spell it here, the old sorty sign, yeah? Now that ain't just any exit sign. That's a, that's a battery backup where when the world ends, it'll still be lit, exit sign, yeah? And the wallboard material here, you know it's all code selected because it's fireproof, fire retardant material. The concrete slab foundation on your feet, the carpet on top of the secret, you sit on the table in front of you are all code selected because they're fireproof, fire retardant material. We prepare, prepare, prepare for fire. There's not one thing in this room that would burn. You still, we have fire sprinklers, fire exits, fire alarms, fire trucks, fire drills, fire hydrants. This fire guy, is he crazy? This fire guy, is he paranoid? Now we all agree he's our A student. It's because of this fire guy and multiple redundant overlapping layers of protection, not a single kid has been killed by school fire in half a century. But you try to prepare for violence, people's first response is denial and anger. Have you ever heard of the old Kubler-Ross stages? Yeah, Kubler-Ross response, I had the pleasure of, of uh, hearing her speak one time. Remarkable, remarkable human being. The short model is denial, anger, bargaining, acceptance, yeah? And the first response is denial and anger. We're in denial when it comes to violence. You take any step, the next response is anger. People get angry when you try to prepare for violence because it pops their little denial bubble. They'll get over it. They'll get over it. It'll pass. Let them vent and move quickly to bargaining and acceptance. You understand? Because our children are more precious than all the gold and all the banks in all the world. And can we agree that our children need to be protected like our money? Yeah? So we really are doing a good job. Come back, though, to the library in Columbine High School. The teacher in the library in Columbine High School has spent a lifetime preparing for fire. Can we all agree that a fire in that room, the teacher would known instinctively, reflexively what to do, yeah? But the thing most likely to kill our kids, violence is happening. Teacher ain't got a clue what to do. Now listen, it is not the teacher's fault. If a school never does fire drills, whose fault is it? Not the poor kid, the poor teacher gonna die because of it. If a school never does lockdown drills, whose fault is it? Not the poor kid, the poor teacher gonna die because of it. But the teacher in the library in Columbine High School should have put the kids in the librarian's office. Lock and barricade their door, turn off the light. You make a very sound argument if she did on that one thing. All but one of the murders in Columbine High School take place in the library. If she had done that one thing, 
take your kids, put them in the librarian's office, lock and barricade the door. You make a pretty sound argument that the total loss of life would have been one. But she didn't know. And so she did the worst thing humanly possible. She tried to secure her kids in an unsecurable location. She told the kids to hide in the library. The library's big plate glass windows. It's an aquarium. It's a fishbowl. She told her kids to hide in a fishbowl. The killer's coming down the hallway. Quick, what's the killer's goal? What's the killer's goal? What do they want? They want to kill. They want a body count. They want to carve their name in history in our children's body and blood. They look through the windows. They see the kids huddled under the tables. What do the killers see? Targets. Fish in a barrel. Fame and immortality on a glass platter. They blast out the windows. They step to the library. They hunt the students down one by one. One by one, they mock them and torment them and make them beg for their lives. And one by one, they execute them. Usually with a shotgun blast. Usually point blank to the face or head. I hope none of you have ever had to see what a 12-gauge shotgun does human head at point blank range. They can we all agree it's not good? Anything funny about that? Anything funny about that? Anything good about that? No. As the killers executed his kid, they laughed and they roared. Whoa, look at that. Look at that. Do it again. Whoa, look at that. You see, they've seen it from the youngest days in the movies in state-of-the-art detail. And they cheered and they snacked and they laughed. Like Pavlov's dog, they've been taught to associate vivid depictions of human death and suffering with what? Their popcorn, their candy bar, their soda, the girlfriend's perfume. Remember old Pavlov? Ring the bell, feed the dog. In just a week, all you had to do is ring the bell, the dog's salivating. Salivation is the autonomic nervous system response. You cannot consciously make it happen. At a deep gut basic level to the kids, violence was the same as their food and their popcorn, their candy bar, their soda, the girlfriend's perfume. And like B.F. Skinner's rats, they inflicted it tens of thousands of times in the video games. And stated their detail, and they cheered, and they got points. Remember old B.F. Skinner in the rat lab? I ran the rat lab at West Point as a psych professor. Within an hour, the slowest cadet could teach the slowest rat. <laughs> Press the bar when the light's on, you're going to get food. When our kids have been caught tens of thousands of times, blow people's heads off in explosions of blood, you get points. What kind of a sick, sick human being could execute a kid, splash their brains across the floor, watch them gurgle and gasp out their last breath, and then do it again and again and again and again? What kind of sick person could do that? The kind of kids we're raising every day, who've been taught from the youngest days to associate pleasure and reward with human death and suffering. And one by one, they execute the kids while the teachers curl up in a supply cabinet. One of those double door supply cabinets. See, the whole room's an Easter egg hunt with people hidden everywhere. The teacher heard every gunshot. She heard every child beg for their lives. She heard it all. Last I heard, that teacher's still alive. Can we all agree if that had been us, huddled helplessly, listened to our children die? If that had been us, if we're not physically destroyed, we'd be psychologically shattered, yeah? That's why denial kills us twice. Denial kills us once physically, because at the moment of truth, you haven't prepared, you don't know what to do, but it kills us twice psychologically. If there's simple, straightforward things we could and should have done, like lockdown drills, and we don't do it and people die, we're gonna have trouble living with ourselves, yeah? In this case, denial killed him a third time. It killed him financially. They were sued and they were successfully sued. The single most likely thing to kill the kids is violence. They've done nothing to prepare for it. You are negligent. You've done nothing to prepare for the possibility of violence. Open the checkbook. Start writing big honking checks for every dead and injured kid because you are negligent if you fail to prepare and to try to prevent violence. The Nile killed them physically, killed them psychologically, killed them financially, and it killed them one last time. It killed them professionally. Many of the individuals entrusted the lives of the children will never again be placed in a position of authority, starting with the sheriff voted out of office in the next election. Can you understand? Denial is our enemy. We must prepare for violence like the firefighter prepares for fire. He's our A student, yeah? Denial is our enemy. It kills us physically and psychologically, and if we're not careful, it'll destroy us financially and professionally. 
the Nile has no survival value. After all of these tragic events that have happened in our colleges and our schools, we are negligent, negligent. At this point, there is no excuse not to take steps to protect our kids, yeah? So one of the things we're doing worldwide is we're deterring these little killers. We're putting armed cops in our school, and it works. I cannot find one single case where a multiple homicide happened in a school when there was an armed police officer present in that building. These killers fear one thing. What do they fear? They're not afraid to die. Some of them want to die. What do they fear? They fear failure. They fear failure. And if they think they can't succeed, they just won't try. The greatest achievement is the kid we didn't have to shoot. The crime that didn't happen, deterrence. And across the world, we put our kids, we, 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 around the world, we, we, we put cops in our schools. And it works. But it is not normal. Never let yourself think it's normal to put tens of thousands of cops in our schools to stop the kids from killing each other. These cops in our schools, it works, but it is not normal to put tens of thousands of armed police officers in our schools to stop the kids from killing each other. This is not normal. So we deter these little killers by the thousands. We detect them. Ain't gonna be no more Columbines. In Columbine High School, they, uh, they, they, they sat on the perimeter for an hour. Well, this, these kids rampage through the school. It will never happen again. Yesterday, I was in, uh, in Niagara, in, in, in Canada here, and we had about 200 police officers in the conference. And, and, and I want you to know, your cops are going in. There won't be another Columbine. They're going in. And, and we're dang good at detecting these little killers ahead of time. So we, we, we I bet every elementary, every middle school and high school educator in this room, and every cop, I'll bet you know one or two cases where we caught the kid with a gun, we caught him with a bomb, we caught him with a hit list, and it never got in the national news. It probably never got in the local news. But if you personally know one or two cases never got in the news, how many are there nationwide? We detect hundreds of these kids every year. They're just kids. They're not that sophisticated. And if we look for it, and we are looking for it, if we look for it, most of the time we can spot it. We deter them by the thousands. We detect them by the hundreds. We, we, we delay them. We have turned our world inside out to mitigate the harm, to slow this guy down. When we talk about delay, there's a couple of things we can do to slow this guy down. Ooh, that's not right. Here we go. When we talk about delay, <laughs> the things we can do is, uh, is single point of entry. Keep the back doors locked. Our children are so precious, we must keep those back doors locked and control access into our building. Single point of entry, we're doing it. And an and, and individual room has got to be securable fast. We're doing that. And drills. We've got to do our lockdown drills. We're doing that. We're doing things to delay this guy, to mitigate the harm. Single point of entry costs nothing. Keep those back doors locked. Folks, uh, I know half a dozen cases directly, another half a dozen indirectly. Every single time, the same crime, different perpetrator. A pervert goes in the unlocked back door of an elementary school. Goes in the girl's bathroom and hides in one of the stalls. He waits and there's only one little girl in the bathroom. Then he comes out and rapes the little girl. Oh, the back door of the elementary school is locked now. They've been fired, they've been fined, they've been sued, they've been financially, professionally destroyed because they were too much trouble to keep that back door of the elementary school locked. It happened in, uh, in Killeen, Texas. It happened just south of Toronto. Remember that one? All the others, I can't tell you where they happened because it never hit the news and they asked me not to say. But it happened in, uh, in, in Kingston, Ontario. Just a l little less than a year ago, I was training cops in Kingston, Ontario. And they told me that the teacher heard the little girl scream. The teacher just happened to be walking past the bathroom. Teacher runs in the bathroom, and there's a guy in the process of gagging the little girl. He sets her down and walks out. Nobody in that building to stop the man. To this day, they have no idea who he is. Nothing but children and women in that building. And 
nobody there to stop the man. Anybody that wants to could simply walk in the back door. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is horribly wrong. We must keep the back doors locked. There's people always popping out for a smoke, propping over the door. No, no more, no more. A single point of entry costs nothing. Individual rooms securable fast. And the best bet is to have our classroom doors locked all the time. One elementary teacher told me one time, she said, you know, I, I, I cannot get them to keep the back door of our school locked. People are always propping it open. And I am the very first classroom you're gonna come to when you come in that back door. I'm not stupid. My classroom door is locked all the time. My car doors lock automatically when I drive off. The front door of my house is locked whether I'm in the house or not. And I got a classroom full of precious first graders and I can't be bothered to lock my door. There must be something wrong with me, yeah? So we're, 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 we're locking the back doors of the school, the classrooms, we're locking the classes, we're conducting our drills so that people know what to do. No, we've done many, many things to slow this kid down and mitigate the harm. So we, we delay them and mitigate the harm. And all these delay things are also deterrents. Across Canada and across North America, we started doing lockdown drills. And I believe one of the major reasons why we've reduced the number of little killers is because of the lockdown drills. What does this killer fear? What do they fear? They're not afraid to die? What's the one thing they all fear? They fear failure. And if they know that, they're, that, that you're ready for them, if you're doing lockdown drills, they're less likely to do it. I believe we have saved countless lives simply by doing the lockdown drills because they serve as a deterrent. Do you understand? All these actions that we take to delay also act as deterrents. The, these all work together as deterrents. So we deter these kids by the thousands. Thanks. We detect them by the hundreds. We defeat them. You see, most people here never heard. Oops. <laughs> we defeat them. I'm willing to bet nobody here heard about Spokane, Washington. The kids, the, the, the cops in Spokane, Washington were in the door in five minutes flat and put a rifle slug in that kid. He survived. Nobody died that day. It's not on anybody's list. Nobody died. First words are the kid's mouth. How'd you get here so fast? Yeah. Oh, we are darn good at going in the door like thunder and shooting our kids before they get a body count. But it is not normal. It is not normal to practice going to our schools and shooting our kids. Never let yourself think this is business as usual. It is not normal to have to keep those back doors locked and lock our classroom doors. This is not business as usual. It is not normal to put tens of thousands of cops in our schools around the world to stop the kid from killing each other. But do you understand? We're deterring them, we're detecting them, we're delaying them, we're defeating them. And still, every couple of years, there's a new all-time record dead. Yeah? The all-time record juvenile mass murder in human history was in, Columb in Littleton, Colorado, or Jonesboro, Arkansas. A year later, it was eclipsed by Littleton, Colorado. Columbine High School. 5,000 years of recorded history. 500 years of gunpowder combat. 150 years of repeating firearms. And not one single time in human history has a single child walked in a classroom and committed a multiple homicide until the late 1970s. Let me say that again. Think about it. Just think about it. 5,000 years of recorded history, 500 years of gunpowder combat, 150 years of repeating firearms, and not one single time in the entire planet has there ever been a single multiple homicide in a school committed by a kid. Until the late 1970s, a double homicide in, in, in a school in California. Then in the 80s, we had a couple more double homicides. In the 90s, it began to take off. We had Pearl and Paducah and Springfield. Then we had Jonesboro. Then we had Columbine and Terry, Alberta. And, and, and you, you've got to understand, we deter them by the thousands, we protect them by the hundreds, we delay them, and we, we defeat them. And still, every couple of years, there's a new all-time record dead in our schools. Now, if you stretch the definition of a juvenile, if we use kind of our common definition of 17 and below, then Columbine's got the record. 
But if you can stretch the definition to about 19, Germany's got two horrendous mass murders that beat Columbine. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Germany has two horrendous mass murders in the schools that beat Columbine. But they were just a little over that juvenile threshold, you hear me? Around the world, we got kids coming to kill our kids. We deter them by the thousands, we detect them by the hundreds, we delay them, we defeat them. And still, every couple of years, there's a new all-term record dead. What's that tell you? There's more of them, there are lots of them. And we've been saying for years, the kids that gave you Jonesboro, the middle school, call them out in the high school, they're gonna give you hell in our colleges. Virginia Tech and NIU and, and Louisa and Votech and Dawson College, it was just, it, it was inevitable. The kids that gave you Tabor, Alberta, and Columbine High School, they're going to give you a very, very hard time in our colleges. It was inevitable. And so in our colleges now, we're deterring them, we're detecting them, we're delaying them, we're defeating them. Our colleges start to take actions, and we need to. Our colleges are responsible to protect the kids, and we're doing it. So I'll make a prediction for you. It's really not much of a prediction. You see it in the news every day. The kids that gave us Jones Pearl in the middle school, Columbine in the high school, Tabor in the high school, Virginia Tech and, and Dawson College in, in, in the colleges, of course they're going to give you pure hell in the workplace and domestic environment the years to come. These guys are not just going to commit suicide. They're going to brutally murder the wife and kids and then commit suicide because the world has got to feel their pain. They got to get their 15 minutes of fame, yes? Oh, they're going to go in the old folks' home in North Carolina and murder your grandparents until a cop shows up and try to commit suicide by cop. You remember that one? They're going to ambush four Mounties and slaughter four Mounties. Never met those men before in their lives. How they murdered four Mounties. Why'd they kill them? Because the uniform they wear. And people who don't even know you try to kill you because the uniform you wear, there's a name for that. What do they call it when people kill each other because of the uniform they wear? What's that called? It's called war. And all segments of our society have declared war. Hey, it was inevitable. And, 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 and folks, they're going to walk in the workout center in Pittsburgh. Remember that one? And murder a bunch of women they've never met. So the world will know how sad it is they could never get a date. Remember that one? They're going to make you feel their pain every step of the way. What happened here in Dawson College, I fear, I fear with all my heart, is going to echo down across the years. We've raised a generation of kids who have been systematically, operantly, and classically conditioned to associate pleasure and reward with human death and suffering. And we will reap what we sow for a generation to come. And we must turn ourselves around now, now. So I want you to take a look at violent crime rates in Canada here. Now, let's, uh, let's start down here with the, the violent crime rate. And the same thing, exactly the same thing happened in America. Uh, violent crime has gone up and up and up. 1962, when the Canadian uh, Center for uh, Justice Statistics began to collect data, violent crime has gone up and up. A little bit of a downturn in the 70s, and then up and up and up. And... It leveled off in the early 1990s. Now, you're looking at a huge increase. If this and this had gone in one year, we would have been stunned. But then what happens is we had a little bit of a downturn in the 90s, a little bit of a downturn in the 90s. When you pop up to property crime, you see the same thing. It goes up and up and up, a little bit of a dip and up again. And then in the 90s, it began to go down a little bit. When we look at total criminal code in Canada, same story, up, up, up. Little dip, up again, and then a little downturn. Now, remember that pattern. That pattern goes up, 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 a little dip down, because you're going to see that exact, exact same pattern right here. Here is the violent crime rate in America. The murder rate per capita has gone up and up and up, and then down a little bit. You see, the murder rate's being held up by medical technology. The doctors are saving ever more lives every year, and that holds down the murder rate. But the rate at which our citizens are trying to kill each other off has gone up and up and up, and then a little bit of a downturn in the 90s. 
And I can show you dozens of countries around the planet that have the exact same pattern. Nation after nation after nation. Violent crime goes up and up and up, and then a little bit of a downturn in the 90s. And still, still, it's at levels never seen before in history. This is uh, data collected worldwide. We've got to ignore the murder rate. The murder rate completely misrepresents the problem. Let, let me introduce you to a concept that I think is vital, vital to understand what's happening here. The murder rate is being held down by medical technology. Major, major UMass Harvard study, irrefutable data, peer-reviewed journal. If we had 1970s medical technology, the murder rate would be four times what it is. Add up the number of people murdered in Canada last year. Multiply by about four. That's how many would have died if we had 1970s medical technology. This research is already a decade old. Incredible leaps and bounds of life-saving skills have been added to the table since then. This is actually out of date. The number would probably be higher. And, now that's embarrassing. I had my alarm set. That was when I was supposed to get up this morning. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I've been in five cities this week, and, uh, and I was looking forward to a little bit of, little bit of snooze there, but it's all right. If we had 1930s medical technology, think about the 1930s. No 911 systems, no phones for most people. No ambulance services, no automobiles for most people. When you finally get the poor guy to the hospital, no antibiotics. Ain't been invented yet. How many more would die of their knife wounds, combat wounds, trauma wounds, gunshot wounds in a world without penicillin? Easily 10 times as many. Folks, from this point on, anytime anybody talks to you about the problem in terms of the murder rate, I want your baloney meter to drown them out, yeah? We have what I call a cancer of crime. You know why cancer is so dangerous? Because the body doesn't know it's there. The body doesn't know to fight it. The body fights the infection. The body fights the virus. But the body doesn't know to fight the cancer because it doesn't know it's there. And that's us. We don't realize how bad it is because every year the murder rate is being held down by medical technology. Yeah? So, so that whole murder rate is almost a, a, a red herring, the, the, making us think it's better than it is. On the outside, we look healthy. On the inside, we're eaten alive by the cancer of crime. And around the world, we had a little dip in the 1990s, and still, U.S. began to collect standardized data in 57, Canada in 62. Interpol began to collect standardized data worldwide in 1977. In one generation since 1977, violent crime has doubled in seven European nations per capita tripled in Netherlands, Scotland, Sweden, quadrupled in France and Greece, quintupled in Norway, Australia, New Zealand. Now, I work in a lot of these nations. My book uh, is translated Norwegian. Norway has over a thousand years of crime data. A thousand years of crime data in Norway. When Chris Columbus landed in the New World, Norway already had 500 years of crime data. And never in a thousand years, never in a thousand years, has violent crime changed by more than 10, 20% of generation? Now it goes up 100%, 200%, 300%, 400% in one generation. What's going on? What's the new factor in the equation? And I'll tell you another thing, folks. Let's go back to Canada and talk about that little dip in our crime rates. Let's talk about what we've done to bias that little dip in our crime rates in the 1990s. Everybody wants to know what caused that downturn. Around the world, a little downturn in the 1990s, but still at levels un unspeakable. What gave us that downturn? Many things. Number one was the economy. We employ ourselves. Longest sustained economic boom in modern history. Does poverty and unemployment contribute to crime? What do you think? I think so. There's people who disagree, but I think it's a no-brainer. And, and, and we're sitting on a powder keg right now. You let the unemployment benefits run out. There's a generation out there doesn't mind staying home, drawing unemployment, playing video games. But you let their unemployment benefits run out, and they're going to make you feel their pain. 
So one of the factors during that time, we employ ourselves, and obviously it's one turn around us. And we medicate ourselves. We got Prozac. I won't ask for a show of hands. But I was in a school district recently where they say they got a Prozac salt lick in the teacher's lounge. Yeah? And there's no shame in that. If you have an iron deficiency, we can help with that. You got a serotonin deficiency, we can help with that. There's no shame in that. But around the world, powerful modern antidepressants have been a factor in bringing crime down. Now, there's a goofy myth out there. All the school killers are on Ritalin. All the school killers are on Prozac. You ever heard that one? Dang lie, Dr. Jim McGee the FBI consultant did a definitive study of 19 juvenile mass murders in our schools. There's never been a juvenile mass murder in the school in human history. And now they're everywhere. And we got a study of 19 of them. None were on Ritalin. Two, maybe three of the 19 were prescribed antidepressants. And we're pretty sure they were off their meds. One of the Columbine killers said in his journal, I must stop the drug to build my rage. You cannot make the argument that medication contributed to these crimes. You make a pretty sound argument that been on meds, maybe they wouldn't have done it. Yeah? So we employ ourselves, we medicate ourselves, we secure ourselves. We have become hard targets. Our car doors lock automatically when we drive off. The front door of the house is locked, we're in the house or not. We don't let the kids out at night. We've turned our world inside out to not be victims. The king stands up on the balcony and says, crime is down 5%. The people say that's because walking the park at night is down 95%, yeah? We have turned our world inside out to not be victims. We employ ourselves, we medicate ourselves, we secure ourselves, we police ourselves. Per capita spending on policing around the world has gone up and up and up. And a major factor is the incarceration rate. We incarcerate or we imprison ourselves. Folks, around the world, the incarceration rates have gone up and up and up. And taking violent people off the streets and putting them in jail is an answer. But sooner or later, we gotta get tired of living in a world where the only answer is to build more prisons. We are flat out of prisons. Our worker cops across Canada and America, they're mad. They put violent people in jail, they let them back out again. Well, the jails are full. Everybody you put in, somebody's got to come out. And we've got to get tired of living in a world where the only answer is to build more prisons. We are out of prisons. We will never again be able to incarcerate greater, greater portions of our society. Per capita incarcerations have gone up and up and up and up around the world. But we slammed head right on into the wall. Putting greater, greater portions of your violent citizens in jail is like putting more and more debt on your credit card. Sooner or later, you're gonna max out that credit card and we are maxed out. So we incarcerate ourselves, we medicate ourselves, we secure ourselves, we police ourselves. And still we see violent crime far, far above what it has been in years past. What's going on out here? What's the new factor in the equation? What is the new factor that was never there before in all these nations? Whatever your pet topic is, whatever your pet topic is, it has got to apply to all of these nations. Again, take a look around the planet. What's the one thing all these nations have in common? So some have gun control, some don't. Some have death penalty, some don't. Some have uh, population density, some don't. Some have immigration, some don't. Some have racial tension, some don't. Some have prayer in school, some don't. Some have abortion, some don't. I'm not saying these things aren't important. I'm saying whatever your pet topic is, I will show you a nation that has it, I will show you a nation that doesn't have it. And they both have doubling, tripling, quadrupling of violent crime. Japan! My books are translated in Japanese. It's a real trip to see your own book in Japanese. Dang, <laughs> didn't know I knew that. Been to Japan twice now. Last time we were in Japan, juvenile violent crime rate announced that year from the previous year. In Japan, juvenile violent crime the previous year had gone up 43% in one year. If your mutual fund goes up 43% in one year, you're a happy customer. Juvenile violent crime goes up 43%. We got a problem. What's the new factor in Japan? What's the new factor that was never there before? Whatever it is, 
It's happening in Singapore. Y'all heard of Singapore? I worked there. Singapore is, is a remarkable place. Singapore is a nation that will beat you for graffiti. Heard of the caning they do? Singapore is a nation with automatic death penalty for armed robbery. That was my snooze alarm, I guess. Singapore will automatic death penalty for armed robbery. Use a weapon in a robbery in Singapore, and they will execute you, and I mean right now, the appeals process takes about a month. People say, our problem is we gotten soft on crime. Well, you might have a point. But can we all agree Singapore is not soft on crime? Yeah. And the last time I was in Singapore, the violent crime rate announced that year from the previous year, Singapore had a 48% increase in juvenile violent crime in one year. What's the new factor in Singapore? What's the one new factor in all these nations that was never there before? And every single industrialized nation around the planet has seen the exact same phenomenon. What is the one factor that's in all those nations? The one new factor. Well, obviously you know where we're headed. It was July of the year 2000. We had a bipartisan, bicameral congressional conference in Washington, D.C. Both houses of Congress, both parties. I've testified for the Senate and the House on three different occasions, but this is a biggie. We had a joint statement by the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. All of our doctors, all of our psychologists, all of our pediatricians, all of our child psychiatrists told both houses of Congress what the new factor is. If all these people agree, should we give them five minutes of our time? I think maybe so. What they said was 30 years of research a thousand sound scholarly studies have proven media violence causes violence in our society. Television, movies, and video games. They said the video games are particularly dangerous because of their, quote, interactive nature. Remember I told you about Dr. Jim McGee, FBI consultant, definitive study on 19 juvenile mass murders? He and I have co-trained almost a dozen times now. The one thing all those school killers have in common is violent television, movies, and video games. This new generation of killers got one thing in common. They dropped out of life and they immersed themselves in the culture of violence. None of the school killers are in varsity sports. Someday we'll find some kid on the team who sincerely wants to kill everybody. So far, there have been one. None of the school killers are in uh, Boy Scouts or, or FFA or 4-H. None of the school killers are, are, are active in the church youth group. None of the school killers will willingly participate in any structured, disciplined adult activity. With one minor exception, three of the 19 were in band. Band is good, I got three boys, we made them take band. As soon as we stopped making them take it, they dropped it like a hot rock, yeah? So none of the kids would willingly participate, none of these killers would willingly participate in any structured, disciplined adult-led behavior. So what did all the school killers do with every free moment of every day? They played video games. The new factor around the world. All the old problems are still there, and they're still important. But the new factor is violent visual imagery. How do we learn? Classical conditioning. The kids have learned to associate pleasure and reward, like Pavlov and the, and the dog and the bell. Uh, the, the, the dog, the bell, the food. For them, it's violent visual imagery and food. Do you understand? It is truly Pavlovian classical conditioning. How do we learn? Classical conditioning, operant conditioning. In the military, we've had enormous difficulty getting people to kill. Throughout the history, people were just not willing to kill the poor guy in front of them. The, 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 the killing rate, uh, my book on killing, it, it outlines it. It's required reading across the world. It's translated many languages. It, we're having trouble getting people to kill. You see, inside the mind of frightened, angry human beings is a biological barrier against killing your own kind. Uh, Cold-bloodedly uh, murdering them, poisoning them, dropping bombs from 10,000 feet, firing artillery from two miles away, phew, that's easy. But when you're angry and when you're scared to look a human being in the eyes and kill them, that's hard. 
Everybody in this room, at one time or another, has been absolutely overwhelmed with rage. Everybody in this room, at one time or another, has been absolutely overwhelmed with anger and rage, and yet you didn't kill the person you were mad at. Either that or you hid the body real well. Yeah? <laughs> you become absolutely livid with rage, overconsumed with anger, and yet you didn't kill. Why? Because inside the mind of every healthy member of every species is a resistance to killing their own kind with very few exceptions. Animals with antlers and horns slam head to head in the most harmless fashion in their territorial mating battles. But against any other species, go to the side, they got, they gore with their horns. Piranha will hit, sink their teeth in anything that hits the water except what? Other piranha, and they fight each other with flicks of the tail. Rattlesnakes will sink their fangs in anything and everything except what? Another rattlesnake, and they wrestle each other. Hardwired into most species, especially when the forebrain shuts down and, and, and the mammalian, reptilian brain is in charge, hardwired in us is the resistance to killing. In World War II, only 15% of the troops would fire their weapon to kill. Having a 15% firing rate among your riflemen is like having a 15% literacy rate among your librarians. Yeah? We got to fix this, and so we did. And we did it with operant conditioning. B.F. Skinner was involved from the very beginning. Pop-up targets, condition stimulus. The target pops up in front of you. Condition response, you hit the target. Target drops, reward schedule, it's all there. It's all there, operant conditioning from the very beginning. B.F. Skinner was systematically applied to make killing a condition response. And when you're frightened and you're angry, you will do what you're conditioned to do. And we brought the firing rate, the killing rate, up from 15% in World War II to 95% in Vietnam. If it troubles you that we're opulently conditioning our troops to kill, how much more so should it trouble you that the video games are doing the exact same thing without the safeguards to children, yeah, to children? How do we learn? Classical conditioning, operant conditioning, social learning models. The social learning models in so many ways are insidious. And we give them violent role models from their youngest days. And, 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 and it's happening. But the final piece of the equation is this. Opera conditions, classical conditions, social learning, it's all there. But there's one other component. Violent visual imagery inflicted upon children makes fight-or-flight hormones flood, flood through their brain. Violent visual imagery inflicted upon children makes fight or flight hormones flood to their brain. When we get together this afternoon, I will show you the brain scan studies. We were looking inside the brain of a new generation of killers. I, I presented in, I've been in Japan twice. Japan has their scientists got brain scans blowing their doors off. I, I, I've been to Europe with, presenting at UNESCO conferences in Brussels on two different occasions. And the Europeans got brain scan data blowing their doors off. But for my money, the best one so far it is Indiana University Med School, IU Med School. I'll show you the brain scans. It will look inside the brain of a new generation of killers. But here's the good news. Got about three minutes here, and I want to send you out the door with good news. We can detox those kids. That classical conditioning, the operant learning, the social role models are still there. All the social role models decay rather quickly with children. But the major thing we can do is get the fight or flight hormones to flush out of their brain. It takes two or three days to detox a kid. You ever taken a kid camping or hiking or hunting for a week? You ever get away from TV, movie, and video games for a week? The first few days are pure hell. They're miserable. They're miserable. They're detoxing. On the third day, it's like somebody threw a switch. There are various religious camps around the world are telling me, Ain't nothing spiritual happening in this camp for the first two days. Huh? And then on the third day, it's like somebody threw a switch. So we can detox those kids. So here's the good news now. Stanford Med School pioneered a TV turnoff curriculum. And it works. And this TV turnoff curriculum is free. Sitting in our room here is it's one of the great heroes of our time. Christine Paulson. Christine, stand up, take a vow. Hurrah. I'm out casting my little seeds and teaching. I'm up in a place called Escanaba, Michigan. And Christine walked out the door and wrote a federal grant to put this TV turnoff curriculum in every school in her school district. 
Everywhere it went in, we cut violence in half, we cut bullying in half, and we raised test scores by double digits. Of course their test scores go up. The fight or flight hormones are flushed out of their brain. They're not being bullied, they're not being attacked, they're not sleep deprived, of course their test scores are going up. The curriculum is free, you can go online and download it right now. I'll tell you all that this afternoon. But there truly is light at the end of the tunnel. Wherever this curriculum goes in, we cut violence in half, we cut bullying in half almost immediately when we detox the kids. There's always been violence since Cain killed Abel. Will there always be some violence? But you add media violence to the equation, you double, triple, quadruple your risk, you understand? And if you turn that TV off, boom, we cut our violence in half right now. Attendance is up, because they're not being bullied. The National Institutes of Health has certified this curriculum as the single most effective juvenile obesity reduction ever demonstrated. Juvenile obesity. Have there always been some chubby kids? Are there more? What's the new factor? Twinkies, Snickers, Big Mac, Coca-Cola are all over 50 years old. What's the new factor that was never there before? They're sitting on the chubby little tails. The average kid in North America spends over 50 hours a week on their tail. Television, movies, and video games. When just a generation ago, they would have been out burning off energy. I'll tell you more about that. A guy wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods. Very good book. He, he coined the term nature deficit disorder. Nature deficit disorder. So, so obesity is down. Violence is down. Bullying is down. Attendance is up. Uh, oh, test scores are up. But one last little thing. The school district where Christine pioneered it, and they expanded the curriculum to pre-K through 12. They expanded the curriculum. They enriched the curriculum every step of the way. Incredible work being done, and all of that work is available for free online. Download the curriculum pre-K through 12 right now. Well, one last thing. It's been in place now for over four years in a school district in upstate Michigan. Over a period of four years in every single one of those schools, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana use is down at least 40% in every school. Over a period of four years, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana use is down at least 40% in every single school in every category. And in some schools, it's down upwards to 80%. Folks, things are so bad. It is so toxic. It is so bad that when you finally turn that TV off, it is so good that nobody can deny it. Do you understand? It's gotten to a tragic, brutal, brutal state. We employ ourselves, we medicate ourselves, we secure ourselves, we police ourselves, but sooner or later we get to get tired of living in a world. We put tens of thousands of cops in our schools to stop the kids from killing each other. Sooner or later we get to get tired of living in a world where we practice going to the door and shooting our kids. I tell you once again, this is not normal. Juvenile mass murders in the schools that never happened in human history and now they're everywhere. What's the new factor? All the old problems are still there, and they're still important. But the new factor is violent visual imagery inflicted upon children. When you take that factor out, boom, we immediately cut violence in half and begin to change our world. I got nothing but good news for you this afternoon. But right now, it's a quarter till the hour. Thank you for all that you do. Oh. Well, well, one, one final note, if I can. You know, you know, cops can hold back the darkness. Prisons hold in the darkness. Only education will light up the darkness. And never doubt that you can change our world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Huh? Go ahead. <laughs>